Have you ever noticed how similar languages spoken all over Western Eurasia are? Or how deities that are worshipped thousands of miles apart share striking similarities? Because I certainly have. As it turns out, this is not just a coincidence. If you're from any of these places, you probably share a great, 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 etc. grandparent. This is because all of these cultures share one common ancestor, the Proto-Indo-Europeans. While we know that these Proto-Indo-Europeans existed, we know little else about them. We have no written records, no surviving oral tradition, and we don't even know where or when they lived. Everything we do know about them, we have learned by reconstructions. By comparing and contrasting common aspects of its descendant cultures, and more importantly, their languages, we can get a reasonable estimation of what they were like. While this method is far from perfect, we've been able to reconstruct surprisingly large parts of their religion, language and society this way. The word for human in many of its daughter languages is related to the Proto-Indo-European word for Earth. The PYE word for human also had connotations of mortality. Meanwhile, their word for God was derived from their word for sky. This suggests that the Proto-Indo-Europeans saw a dichotomy between humans, who were earthly and mortal, versus the divine, which was neither. The Proto-Indo-Europeans were polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many gods. Several of them have been reconstructed, the most important of which was called Dios, which translates to Sky God. He was also known by the epithet Dios Pater, or Sky Father. As this name implies, he was the divine representation of the sky. Given that they saw the sky as the domain of the gods, you can see how he would have been a pretty big deal, although it is unlikely that they were seen as the leader of the gods. Instead, it is believed that he represented the dwelling of the gods. Reflexes of him can be found in the Greek Zeus, the Roman Jupiter, and the Vedic Zeus. Zeus was married or in some form of relationship with the earth goddess Dagon. Where Zeus represents the realm of the gods, she represented the realm of mortals. The pairing of them is associated with fertility, with her rains from the sky blessing the ground and allowing plants to grow. And she is sometimes referred to as Mother Earth, in contrast to the Sky Father. Reflexes of her include Kutivi, who was paired with Zeus, or Demeter, who bore Persephone from Zeus. With Zeus being called the Sky Father and Zeus being a reflex of him, it probably won't surprise you to hear that he fathered many children. The most important of these was Hausos, the Proto-Indo-European goddess of the dawn. She is depicted as the opener of the doors to her father, the sky, representing how the dawn proceeds the day. In many descendant myths, she is depicted as doing this task reluctantly, which goes to show that even the goddess of the morning struggles to get out of bed. Reflexes include the Roman Aurora, the Hindu Ushas, and the Latvian Oseklis. Another set of Theo's crotch goblins is a set of twins who have no reconstructed names, but are usually either called the Divine Twins or the Horse Twins. One of them is depicted as being a warrior, and the other a healer. Their job is to pull the sun across the sky, either by riding the horses that pull the sun, or by being these horses themselves. They are also involved in a myth where they rescue houses from trouble at sea, representing how the sun rises from over the ocean's horizon. Reflexes of them include the Roman Castel and Pollux, or the Vedic Divonapata. Another important reconstructed god is Perkunos, god of lightning, storms, and oak trees for some reason. Thunder is usually accompanied by rain that provides the water necessary for trees to grow, which explains the seemingly random connection with trees. The name Perkunos meant something akin to striker or hitter, and one of his other duties was fighting demons. Reflexes of him include the Lithuanian Perkunas and the Vedic Paryanya. The existence of other thunder-related entities like Thor or Jupiter Thonis hints at an epithet stemming from the PYE word ten, which means thunder. They had more gods, but less is known about their characterization, and for some, there is doubt over whether or not they actually existed. We know that they had a sun goddess and a moon god, whose names have been reconstructed as Sehul and Manot. They also likely had one or multiple fire and wind gods, along with water or river deities that seduced and then drowned mortal men. They also probably had gods pertaining to all sorts of societal matters, such as welfare, war, and smithing. We also know that they believed in some form of underworld. This nether realm was probably separated from the mortal realm by a river, and was guarded by a dog that may have had multiple heads and definitely had multiple eyes, and whose name roughly translates to Spot. The existence of this underworld also implies the existence of some sort of god related to it. Besides this colorful cast, we have also been able to reconstruct several PYE myths, my favorite of which is their creation myth. It takes place in a time preceding existence, where even non-existence did not yet exist. 
In this non-existent non-existence, there existed a pair of brothers, named Man and Twin, and a third man named Third. Being bored of not existing, Man sacrificed his brother, because at least it was something to do I guess, and with the help of the gods, he created the earth from his flesh and grass from his hair. Humans emerged from the body of Twin, with priests emerging from his head, warriors from his body, and farmers coming from his <coughs> nether region. Third received the cow which was presumably named Cow as a gift from the god, but it was promptly stolen by a three-headed serpent named Snake. Aided by the power of either Geos or Pragunos and a shit ton of alcohol, Third managed to slay the serpent and return the cow to man. Man sacrificed the cow, resulting in the creation of animals and vegetation. There are a few interesting tidbits here. The cow stealing was likely used as a moral justification for both stealing your neighbor's cattle and murdering your neighbors for stealing your cattle, since it is depicted in the myth as protecting what is rightfully yours. The tripartition between priests, warriors and farmers, which is present in many Indo-European societies, is also at the forefront of this myth. Not only in the groups that emerged from Twin, but also in the first priest in Man, the first warrior in Third, and the first farmer in Cow. Echoes of the story can be found in many descendant Indo-European mythologies. The fratricide might remind you of the story of Romulus and Remus, and the cow raiding of Hermes stealing Apollo's cows, or the Irish Tyne Bogulain. Examples of a thunder or sky related entity fighting a snake monster are even more numerous. If the Greek myths of Zeus slaying Typhon and his son Hercules killing the Hydra, the Norse had Thor slaying Jormungandr, the Slavic storm god Perun killed the dragon god Veles, and even the Japanese Shinto, which is not strictly Indo-European but was heavily influenced by the Vedic religion, features the storm god Susano slaying the eight-headed serpent Orochi. These myths were spread via the spoken word. And speaking of speaking, the proto and the Europeans had a language. Flawless segue mate, thanks bro. Anyways, language. The discovery that kick-started research into the Proto-Indo-Europeans was when Sir Williams Jones noticed that many languages spoken in Europe and India sounded suspiciously alike. Research into a proposed shared ancestor language is what led to the discovery of everything discussed in this video. Linguists reconstructed this hypothetical shared ancestor language using what's known as the comparative method. Languages evolve and change over time. These changes follow sound laws. The most famous of these laws is Grimm's law. It was discovered by Rasmus Rask, but named after Jacob Grimm, who you might know for writing every fairy tale ever, who said the same thing as Rask, but louder and not in Danish. It describes the sound changes that PYE underwent when it evolved into Proto-Germanic, and it is the reason why many words that start with an F in English start with a P in Italian, among other changes. The Neo-Grammarian rule states that these sound changes apply universally. This allows linguists to reverse engineer PYE from its daughter languages. When reconstructing words, linguists mainly look at three languages, Latin, Ancient Greek, and Sanskrit. Because these were as old as well-preserved descendants, they are thought to be the most similar to PYE. Take a look at the PYE word father, which you have already seen in the god Deus Pater. The Latin word for father is pater, the Greek word is pater, and the Sanskrit word is Peter. Using this, they have been able to reconstruct the PYE word pater. Repeat this process about a bazillion times, and you end up with a rough estimation of the Proto-Indo-European language. Large parts of this language have been reconstructed, and besides words, we've also been able to reconstruct parts of their grammar rules using a similar method. This language can tell us a lot about how they lived. For example, it can be used to find out what technologies they possessed. As part of Grimm's law, many words that started with a k sound in PYE changed to a h and later a h in Germanic languages. Look at the English words house and hill and compare them to the Spanish words casa and colina. You can see the shift from C to H here, indicating that they had a common origin in PYE. But if you look at the English word car and the Spanish word coche, this shift is absent. This tells us that the Proto-Indo-Europeans probably had houses on hills, but no cars. Now, we did not need reconstructions to tell us this, but there are cases where it's actually helpful. For example, we have been able to reconstruct words for axle and wheel. This means that while they did not have cars, they did have some sort of wheeled vehicles. We've also been able to reconstruct words for field, grain and plow, meaning that they knew how to grow crops. We can also tell something about how their society was structured. The existence of words for concepts like wealth and servant suggests that besides the previously mentioned split between priests, warriors and farmers, 
There also was a division between these rich classes, the poor free men and the slaves. We also know that their society was extremely patriarchal, to the point that the word for a male marrying a female is the same as the word for to lead away. Their language can also tell us about who they interacted with and what these interactions were like. For example, the word for to sell in PYE is a loanword coming from a Proto-Uralic language that was spoken around the Ural Mountains. This tells us that they likely traded with the people living there. Besides the hints their language gives us, we can also reconstruct certain traditions from their descendant cultures. One example of this is the Kurios, a ritual boys had to undergo to become men. The Kurios was a warrior band consisting of groups of young unmarried men. These men took the names of animals and were sent into the wilderness, where they participated in fun bonding activities such as roasting marshmallows, hunting animals, and brutally pillaging neighboring communities. While we know quite a lot about their culture and language, the most important part of the puzzle is still missing. We don't know where, or even when, the actual Proto-Indo-Europeans lived. There are, however, a lot of theories, which range from fairly plausible to ancient aliens. The theory with the most support is the Steppe theory. This theory attributes the Proto-Indo-European culture and language to the Yamna culture, who lived in the lands north of the Black Sea between 3500 BC and 2500 BC. These were the people who first domesticated the horse, which allowed them to spread their culture across large parts of Europe and Western Asia. The Anatolian hypothesis, which has significantly fewer followers than the steppe theory, states that they lived in what is now Turkey during the Neolithic era. The culture and language of these people peacefully spread to the rest of Europe through assimilation due to advancements in farming. Then there are other, less mainstream theories that propose Armenia, the Baltics, Northern India or Western Iran as the original homeland of the Indo-Europeans. Finally, there is the Paleolithic continuity theory which links the Proto-Indo-Europeans to the first people to set foot in Europe. No matter who they were, the Proto-Indo-Europeans have undoubtedly had a massive impact on the world. And while their people may be long dead, their culture still lives on in billions of people walking the earth today. Thank you for watching, I've been Thomas and I hope to see you next video where I take a nice relaxing beach holiday. Hiya!